أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا مولاي يا رسول الله وعلى أهل بيتك المذلومين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا مولاي مولاي وابن مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة يا غريب يا مذلوم يا أتشان كربلا ما خاب من تمسك بكم والأمنا من لجأ إليكم سادتي يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا معكم فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم والقول كالحق والأستق القائلين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ولقد كرمنا بني آدم وحملناهم في البر والبحر ورزقناهم من الطيبات وفضلناهم على كثير ممن خلقنا تفضيلا آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صل على محمد وعلى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد الله سبحانه وتعالى created the creation the sun and the moon and the stars the oceans and the rivers all as an opportunity for us to reflect upon them so that we're able to understand who our Creator is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran, سَنُرِيهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَا لَهُمُ لَهُمُ الْحَقِّ That God had created His signs in the heavens and within their own selves so that they reflect and so that they understand that He Himself has truth in its entirety. That God created all of these creations as a sign for us. Meaning that they are supposed to be a mechanism for our own growth again. When we see the sun and when we see the moon and when we see the stars and when we see the seasons changing, they're all supposed to be a means by which we think about the uniqueness of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, SubhanAllah, all glory be to God for He is the one who created all of this. It is stated that whenever the Prophet ﷺ would conclude his prayers, he would often spend a little bit of time in reflection and contemplation and meditation. And he would often do that outdoors. He would walk around in the streets, for instance, and he would look up at the stars, and he would call out, for instance, Ilahi, Rabbana ma khalaqta hadha batila, subhanak. That, oh my Lord, all glory be to you. Surely you didn't just create this in vain. There is a purpose behind all of this. But oftentimes when we take a look at who we are as a human being and how self-centered we are, we forget that we are actually just one really small part in this incredibly large ecosystem that is created by the Creator Himself. And that we forget to recognize the uniqueness of the beauty of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For God, He Himself, what does He state? He says that after I created the creation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He quotes Himself within the whole Qur'an, فَتَبَارَكَ اللَّهُ أَحْسَنُ الْخَالَقِينَ So all blessing and all praise is due to God, the best of, his, the best of creators. God is praising Himself because He is the best of all creators. We as a human being, we can't say, look at this amazing thing that I did. Because, if it's, because in reality, if it's void of the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we wouldn't have been able to accomplish anything. So whenever something good happens, we're supposed to be in a state of thankfulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what's of course different when we compare ourselves toward God, is God doesn't have to humble Himself in front of anyone. So he says, look at this creation, I'm the best of creators. That's supposed to be a means by which we look at creation, and that we think about creation, and that we understand again about the uniqueness of creation. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala numerous times within the whole of the Qur'an, He even entitles specific chapters after some of His creations. The chapter of the cow and of the ant and of the bee and of thunder and so on and so forth and of light. And we come and we see that all of that again is supposed to be a means by which we really dig deep down and think about the uniqueness of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Zainab. My daughter. Can't get mad at her. If there's any of your kids, I wouldn't get mad at them either. The uniqueness again of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that everything that we see within God's creation, we see beauty. And everything within the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we see God. Because at the end of the day, what is all of this created for, except to allow for us as a human being to understand Him? We have other traditions, for instance, and other Qur'anic verses that tell us to go and travel the world. It's okay to go and travel and to go and visit different places. Traditions of Ahlul Bayt والسلام, state that even when you go and you travel to different places, make sure that you try to visit the oldest parts of the cities that you go and visit. So that you think about history and the people who have come before you and the civilizations that have passed. Again, in allowing for us to remember that we are really, really small in this big, vast universe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is ever expanding. But God states within the whole Qur'an also a commandment toward the human being, وَلَا تَمْشِي فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَهَا That the human being, we're an incredibly arrogant and prideful creation. That we think that we own all of this in its entirety. So God states that even when you walk on this earth, don't walk with your feet that's crushing the ground beneath you. Walk softly and walk slowly and walk with a sense of humility. Who are you? No matter what challenges, what difficulties, what successes that we have within the world, guess what? Tomorrow the sun's gonna rise again and we gotta deal with whatever it is that we have to deal with. And then after 70 years, no matter how much we accomplished, 70 years after our 70 years, no one's going to remember our name. But again, the one who humbles himself in front of his Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise him in the eyes of the people. Man tawaba alillah rafa'ahu, the hadith states. That the one who humbles himself in front of God, understanding that everything that we have is from the Creator himself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow for our name and our praise and our legacy to remain in the hearts of people for eternity. And if it's not in the hearts of people, then it's within the knowledge of the angels of the Creator. And again, I give this introduction in order to really speak toward a topic that's vital for every single one of us. And again, like I mentioned last night, really I research a topic like this in order to allow for myself to grow more than lecturing anyone else, because it starts here before I'm able to export knowledge anywhere else. And that today, amongst the most trendy sort of terms and things that we seek, especially in the city, is talking about caring for the environment. Everyone has to jump on the bandwagon in order to really allow for the sense of environmental justice to really be manifest and illuminated within this community of ours. We're a people who just waste a lot. And when we go toward different verses of the whole Qur'an and traditions of Ahlul Bayt we have to understand that the religion of Islam actually should be at the forefront in driving home this ideology of really standing for environmental justice. By creating a system that speaks for equity. By creating a system that understands that we are not the center of the universe, but rather that we are a really, really small part of it. And every time that we again take a look up at the skies and look down at the ground and look to the right and take a look at the left, we have to understand that every one of the creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they all are in praise of the Creator. Numerous times, for instance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states within the whole of Quran, سَبَّحَ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ That everything within the heavens and within the skies and within the earth is in a state of praise and it is a state of glorification of God. We don't necessarily understand the consciousness of a plant, or of a bird, or of the clouds that pass by us in the skies. 
But every single one of those creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are in a state of perpetual praise and glory of the Creator. And that for me to take away the rights of anyone else who is always in a state of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is again against the divine instruction of the Creator. So I want to reflect upon this idea of Islam and environmental justice as always in three different dimensions. The first dimension is in terms of understanding the meaning and the definition of justice according to Islamic theology. Secondly, in terms of understanding what is the environment according to the Qur'an and Ahlul Bayt And thirdly, in terms of how the Qur'an and Ahlul Bayt have offered us practical advices in terms of how we can be at the forefront of establishing environmental justice. So firstly and foremostly again, what is justice within the Islamic tradition and within Islamic theology? We come and we see that adala of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is amongst the most fundamental pillars of our theology. And the idea that we state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the all just. And that all justice that we find within this universe reflects from His absolute and ultimate justice. But the justice that I desire to seek on this earth with my family, with my friends, with my community, to the best of my ability when I'm going different places, in reality doesn't compare to the utter and absolute justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the same way that I can say that I am merciful to my children, I am merciful to my colleagues, I am merciful to someone who wrongs me, that mercy in itself does not compare with the utter and absolute mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because He is Arhamur Rahimin, He is Ar Rahim and Ar Rahman, and there is no mercy except for His mercy. In reality, the only thing that we share with the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the words in it of themselves. Meaning that I share the word mercy, but my mercy does not compare to God's mercy. I share the word justice in terms of semantics, but in reality, my justice does not compare to one bit to the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then what is the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? In the tradition, in Nahj al-Balagha from Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu was salam, he states that the definition of the adl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to place things in accordance with where they should be. So for instance, and I've given this example in different conversations before for those of you who attend our weekly Qur'an tafsir class, that when we talk about what it means when Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen states that justice is placing things where they belong, for instance, that when everyone is entering into this space to coming for the program, it would be the right thing for everyone to take their shoes and put it on the rack without someone on the brother side and without someone on the sister side saying, please take your shoes and put it on the rack. The right thing to do, putting things where they belong, is putting the shoes on the shoe rack. The carpet and the floor is not called the shoe floor. It's called a shoe rack, meaning you take the shoes and you put it on the rack. Similarly, you have some trash, you have some garbage, you have a wrapper, whatever it might be. Trash is supposed to be in the trash can, not on the floor. Placing things where they should be is taking the garbage and putting it where it should be. Someone says, but that's not my shoe, but that's not my wrapper. Again, are we working toward establishing a system of justice and illuminating the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the earth or no? If we are, then it doesn't matter who's it, whose responsibility it, responsibility it is, it's everyone's responsibility toward working and toward striving to putting things exactly where they belong. And when we come toward understanding the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala theologically, we see that theologians have spoken toward the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in three different phases. The first phase of the justice of God is what is known as al-adlu at-takwini, or the universal justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by which He created this universe. Let me explain what I mean over here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the human being with two hands and two feet. And He created us to walk on our feet and not on our hands. While there are other creations of God who walk on all fours or who don't have any, and they use their bellies for instance. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created our eyes on our face and not on our feet. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the sun to rise every morning and the sun to set every evening. All of these manifestations are out of the utter and absolute wisdom of the Creator. And they're also out of the absolute justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that is how things should be. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the one who determines why, why and how things should be. So out of His utter and absolute justice, He states that it's going to be like this because out of my justice, I have the knowledge and I have the understanding and I have the wisdom to create it in this fashion. Without breaking this sort of you know, example up into a million different points, again, the first dimension or the first phase of the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what is known as adlu taqwini the utter and absolute justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of creation. The second type of justice that we speak about when we talk about the justice of the Creator Himself is what is known as Al-Adlu At-Tashri'i or what is known as the legal justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That God created that every single one of the prayers that we pray are designated in specific cycles. Fajr prayers is two rakah. Dhuhr prayers is four, Asr is four, Maghrib is three, Isha is four. Someone says, but I want to pray three at the time of Fajr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you pray three, but that's not the prayer that I established. That performing tawaf around the holy Kaaba is seven rounds. Someone says, I want to do six. Or someone says, I want to do seventy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I said seven. When you go toward performing the Jamarat, on the days of Mina during Hajj, we're supposed to take seven pebbles and strike the Jamarat. Someone asked me a question this year. And they said, what happens if I want to do eight? Some of our fuqaha, they actually say that if you decide to do eight, then you have to start again and make it 14. So as a joke, he said, okay, so what happens if I do 15? I said, well, then you have to start again and make it 21. So he said, okay, I'll just stick with seven. <laughs> right? Sometimes we like to make things a lot more complicated than they should be. But understanding that again, this is all out of the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. God says that it has to be like this because it has to be like this. You can't, for instance, tomorrow morning go into the office of your supervisor and say, from now on, I'm going to take your office. What's going to happen to you tomorrow? You won't, pay, you won't have a job by lunchtime. You say, but this is the way that I want it to be because this is the way that I want it to be. My daughter, four years old, Zainab, she's running around making a lot of noise today. MashaAllah. <laughs> These days, you know what she does? She says, Baba, this is the way that it's going to be because I'm Zainab and I want it like this. <laughs> we say, Zainab, you have to listen to your mama. You have to listen to you. It's going to be our rule. She said, no. I want it like this because I want it like this and I'm Zainab. If she wasn't my daughter and if I didn't love her, right? I don't know what would happen. You can't go again to your place of employment tomorrow when school starts. You can't go to your professor and say, class starts at 8.35. Well, guess what? I'm going to come at 8.45 and there's nothing you can do about it. They're going to say, okay, well, we're going to start deducing a lot of marks. You say, absolutely not. 8.45 is a much more equitable time. No, they set the rules and they set the standard. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the all just. And this is the way that He wanted it to be. And thirdly and finally, we come toward the last phase of the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as defined by some of our theologians, in which they state, or what is known as adl ad jazai or what is known as the compensatory nature of the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. God states, for instance, that if you commit a sin, I'm going to punish you with one punishment, for instance. Or I'm going to write one bad deed on your scroll of deeds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says that if you do one good deed, I'm going to multiply it by 10. Someone says, no, it's only equitable that you give me one good deed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no, I will give you 10. You say, no, but oh Allah, it's fair, just give me one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I'm going to give you 10. Who are we to justify what it means when we talk about divine math? We leave that up to the Creator. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, that for every good deed that you do, there's going to be a reward. And for every bad deed that you're going to do, there's going to be an account. 
And that in this way we see that there are numerous traditions that state that if you perform this deed, you get this reward. You perform this deed, you get this punishment. You perform this prayer and you get the reward of this many prayers. You fast on this day, it's as if you fasted 70 years for instance. You go and you take a look at our traditions and you say, wow, there's so much going on, there's a lot of reward, there's a lot of really wonderful things, there's a lot of great things. I've already gotten paradise. Ziyar Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is worth this many hajj and this many umrah. One day when I was studying in Karbala, I was making ziyar of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is during the days of the Arba'een of the Imam salam alayhi. And I was walking in between Bayn al Haramain, between Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas and Imam al Hussein. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant every one of you the ziyar of Imam al Hussein. There is nothing like the ziyar of Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu salam. Nothing, nothing like it. If you haven't been, we'll talk after the measures. We're going in December, inshallah. I'm giving you guys the first opportunity before I'm even launching it. I'm telling you, we have 40 seats. They're going to get taken up within a week, right? If you want to come for Ziyar of Imam Hussein, alayhi salam, you make the intention and you'll see that it'll happen. And it's an absolutely incredible experience. Someone says, I'm not Shia, this is not for me. This is the grandson of the Messenger of God. You come and you experience what it's like to visit the grandson of the Messenger of God, where you're not restricted in showing your emotion like you are in other places. It's a really something luminous. It's really something powerful. Anyhow, I was walking and I was making ziyara, and one group of young people, they came to me. They're probably like in their early 20s. And they said, I was dressed in my religious garb, and they said, oh, Sheikh, tell me. Me and my friends were having a debate. We're having this discussion. I said, sure, what can I help you with? They said that we walked from Basra to Karbara. It took us 10 days. I said, God bless you. That's incredible. And really that's what they do. People walk to making the ziyar of Imam Hussain. They said, our friend, one of our friends is saying that we actually have to pray. But because we came for ziyar of Imam Hussain alayhi salam, do we have to pray? They say that we thought that the reward of this is worth a thousand prayers or a million prayers or a million years worth of prayers. So we thought that we never have to pray ever again. <laughs> really, people are asking this question, right? You guys think this is funny, this is so unusual. We were just in Hajj. How many people ask me that after the day of Arafah, if we have to pray Fajr prayers? It's too t we're so exhausted. We're, maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us three days off, for instance. It would be a lot nicer like that if we went on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule for Fajr prayers, or a Tuesday, Thursday schedule. But again, it is known as the Adl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that He places things in accordance with exactly the way that they should be. And again, that's what we want to try to understand when we're talking about the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that brings me then toward the second dimension of my discussion. And that is in terms of understanding then what is the environment and then what is our role in terms of establishing justice in the environment. Again, we want to be a people who are emanating the names and the attributes of the Creator. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the all just, He is the all merciful, He is the all generous. He is the all compassionate. He is the all love. And we want to be a people who are acting toward the best of our abilities, even if it means to share the name semantically with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the tradition of the Messenger alayhi salam states, that act in accordance with the etiquette of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's my job then toward striving, toward putting things where they belong, especially in terms of understanding who I am in the midst of this absolute massive creation of the Creator. And when we talk about the environment from an Islamic perspective, we see that scholars have broken up the environment into three different definitions. They've stated that the first definition or the first understanding of environment within Islamic tradition is the natural environment, and that's the one that we want to focus on for a little bit this evening. Meaning the environment that is around us, physically, the ocean, the river, the sea, the air. In a hadith from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam, he states pleasure for the human being, pleasure for the believer is in three. Is in clean air, is in pure water, and is in fertile ground. That within these things, the human being can find a sense of pleasure. A second definition for environment is what they would call a social environment. And this environment also needs to be in a state of equity in order for the believer to progress within their life. And in the tradition from the Prophet ﷺ, he 
he states that the social environment for the believer also has to have three characteristics. The first characteristic is a pious scholar who leads that community. The second characteristic is a place for individuals to be free to socialize, so on and so forth. And thirdly, that they're ruled by an equitable ruler and a trustworthy ruler. And then thirdly, there is what is known as the spiritual environment. The ability for someone to grow spiritually, to be fixated on their creator, to be away from distractions. And in a couple of nights, we'll talk about the importance of solitude within Islamic tradition. Sometimes you need to just be in a state of real mindfulness and focus with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. During the course of nights like these, during the course of nights like during the month of Ramadan, in performance of pilgrimages like that of Hajj and Umrah and Ziyarat, we get like a recharge toward our spiritual battery. That's the whole purpose of it. And again, there's that sense of spiritual environment that is cultivated is necessary, again, for the development of our hearts and of our souls. And the human being has to have an environment in each and every one of these three phases for them to really progress and allow for themselves to benefit in this world and in the next, in terms of the natural environment that, that which is within around us. In the social environment, the ability to be with people and the ability to have a sense of freedom and the ability to practice your religion and your faith and your culture freely. And then thirdly, of course, that ability to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a metaphysical way, free from any sort of distraction. And we have numerous ahadith and numerous Quranic verses that speak to the importance of our responsibility in really cultivating the first of these three. And again, that's talking about the natural environment that we're living in. The verse that I began with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, لَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا Bani Adam." That surely we honored the children of Adam. Every single one of us are the children of Adam. Every single one of us. We can all trace our lineage back to Adam and Eve. When we see Adam on the Day of Judgment, we can go and give him a hug, for instance. When we see his wife Eve, we can go and we can go and kiss her hand. She's our grandmother. Doesn't matter where we came from, doesn't matter what background, no matter what language that we speak, we all are the sons of Adam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that we have honored the sons of of, we have honored the children of Adam. Meaning what? He continues. And he states, and we have given them the ability to travel by air and by water. And we have given them the benefits and the bounties and the blessings of this world. Again, in order for us to reflect. But if God gives us a blessing and that we don't take care of it, then who's going to be held accountable for not taking care of that responsibility? Think about it. If I loan someone something, I ask them, for instance, to hold my phone for me for one hour while I go and I run an errand, for instance. If that phone drops and it cracks and it breaks and so on and so forth, I come back to you and I say, hey man, where's my phone? I say, sorry, it broke. Who's going to be responsible for paying for that phone? You or me? I'm really scared of anyone. So if someone says, your fault, I'm just going to say, okay, it's fine. But in reality, even in an Islamic, according to Islamic justice, even according to sort of a social norm, that person is going to take the responsibility. Okay, yeah, I'm the one who dropped it. I'm sorry. Here it is. I'm going to pay for it, whatever it might be. Naturally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we honored the children of Adam, and we have given them the oceans, and we have given them the rivers, and we have given them the skies, and we have given them the heavens, and we have made them inheritors in the earth, as he states in another verse of the whole Qur'an, or numerous verses of the whole Qur'an. You inherit something, you got to take responsibility for that. And the first one of those responsibilities, according toward our traditions, that when you receive a blessing, at the very least, you're thankful for that blessing. Someone gives you something, you say thank you. How many of us are thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for being, or for being surrounded by greenery, for instance? How many of us are thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the oxygen. How many of us are thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the sun that shines in the sky every morning? You have the sun, you have the clouds, you have the moon, you have the stars, you can breathe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala offered us all of these things. How many of us have been thankful for them ever in our lives? And I'm talking to myself first. When you're going after prayers and you're performing sajjat al shukr you prostrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa ta'ala say, thank you Allah, thank you Allah, thank you Allah, shukran lillah, shukran lillah, shukran lillah, seven times, 14 times, 100 times, whatever we've been taught by our parents, or whatever we've been taught in Sunday school. We don't even know what we're thankful for. <laughs> we just say, thank you Allah, thank you Allah, thank you Allah, thank you Allah, thank you Allah. 
Not until, not until I taught my daughter the practice. By the way, I have two daughters. Let me just say this for one second. If you love me, you know that I have two daughters and not one. Everyone asks, how is Zainab doing? I have another daughter too. <laughs> until I taught her that after we pray, we say, thank you, Allah. She says, Baba, for what? I said, oh shoot, I have no idea. <laughs> I said, I don't know, thank you for anything. She says, thank you Allah for my mama. Thank you Allah for my baba. Thank you Allah for food. Thank you Allah for Imam Hussein. Thank you Allah, I have iPad. Thank you Allah. <laughs> no problem, no problem. In those thankfulness, in, 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 in performing that act of thankfulness, thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He has given you the ability to breathe fresh air. That He has given you the ability to breathe. Not for how many, for, for how many people in hospitals all across the world, it's difficult for them to breathe. In, in, in the du'a of Imam Zainal Abidin, he states, Alhamdulillah, alladhi ja'alani ashtahi. Oh Allah, all thanks is due to you, for you have given me the ability to crave food. What a blessing, we'll talk about that another night. Oh Allah, thank you for giving me the ability to use the restroom. For how many people it's painful. And for how many people it's a relief. SubhanAllah. How many things that God has given us. All we have to do, the first step, is keeping in mind that all of these were given to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once we start with that mindset, automatically we're standing bearers of seeking environmental justice in this world. Because why would I want anyone to pollute my water? Why would I want to be the one who's polluting the water? Why would I be the one who's not going to recycle? Why am I going to be the one who's going to waste? Because all of a sudden I understand that with a gift comes responsibility. And the first responsibility is that I'm thankful for it. Why would anyone take a blessing and then throw it in the trash? All of this is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have numerous ahadith, really a lot of traditions from Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salatu wasalam. A tradition from the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam in which he states that preserve the earth for it is your mother. How would you treat your mother? You treat the earth the same way. Someone says, no, I'm going to throw this on the trash because I pay taxes. And I'm contributing to environmental justice because I pay taxes. Well, again, when you're allowing for someone else to really go and do the job, then again, you're not putting things where they need to be. And that's not illuminating the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that brings me toward the third dimension of my discussion, in which I want to run through a couple of Quranic verses that speak toward our responsibility in establishing environmental justice. The first one of these is a verse within the whole of Qur'an that in reality, I never really reflected upon until last night. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in chapter 18 verse 7, إِنَّا جَعَلْنَا مَا عَلَى الْعَرَضِ زِينَةً لَهَا لِنَبْلُوَهُمْ أَيُّهُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse, He states that surely we have created the earth and all of that within it as a beautification for you. Meaning again, the sun and the moon and the attraction of the trees. You know, how many of you have ever watched the sunset take place? How many of you watched the sunset take place? Raise your hand. Let's do something a little bit different. I'm not going to ask you guys to stand up and do jumping jacks. How many of you watched the sunset take place? How many of you watched the sunrise take place? Great, the majority of us, every single one of us. It's, doesn't it look nice? Why else would we watch it take place? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't have to make it look attractive. He didn't have to allow for the red and the purple and the yellow and all the colors that we have. But He made it beautiful and attractive to us. Other traditions, for instance, from the Prophet and his family, alayhi salam, they state that, sat, uh, that, that, that contentment is brought to a believer when they look at greenery. It didn't have to be green, it could have been black, it could have been white, it could have been I don't know, some other ugly color. But it was green, and green is attractive. Right now we're about to enter into autumn, and the leaves are going to change colors. It looks nice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't have to make it look nice. Over here in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that we have created everything within the earth, and then we have allowed for beauty to be within the earth, so that we can test you so that we can test you and see which one amongst you performs the best of deeds. That's incredible. That's like some deep stuff right there, man. Someone says, no, there's nothing deep about it. Just think about it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decorated the universe as a means to test us. 
Do we appreciate it? Are we thankful for it? Are we doing our best toward preserving it? Really, it's a lot to think about. What of the whole Qur'an? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us this. In the second verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us, Ya Bani Adam, khudu zinatakum inna kulli masjidin wa kulu wa shrabu wa la tusrifu. He states, O oh, again, son of Adam, that take your beauty toward the masjid when you go. I talked about this yesterday. Dress well when you come to the mosque, wear some deodorant, put on some cologne. It's okay, right? No one's going to judge you if you do all those nice things. وَكُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا We've given you food and we've given you drink. وَلَا تُسْرِفُوا But don't waste. Just think about that. Again, someone says, okay, it's obvious, don't waste. Have you seen the type of waste that we perform? And I don't mean this in a way that's demeaning or judgmental. I'm judging myself and I'm demeaning myself before anyone else. That we just waste in a gathering like this. Take a little bit of food. Who's not going to run out, man? It's not going to run out, I promise. We have a lot. Every day we have a lot. Keep coming. And you're going to see that the food is going to be so fantastic the next few nights, inshallah. It's going to be there. If you can't eat it, then don't put it on your plate. Other traditions from the Prophet ﷺ, he states that he was in the gathering with his companions and after the um, uh, sort of after he had completed everything that was in front of him, there was some leftover curry, for instance, leftover grains of rice, so on and so forth, to which the Prophet ﷺ made sure that he picked up everything from that plate. And he ate it, and then he looked toward his companions, and he said, the most blessed part of the meal is the last part. And that if you eat the last part of the meal, meaning everything that is remaining on your plate, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you the reward, if I'm not mistaken, as if you recited 400 verses of the Qur'an for you to not just waste the remaining grains on your plates. Think about how much waste that we perform on a day-to-day -day basis within our own homes. And what we can do to sort of rectify and reconcile that. And again, I talk to myself first. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us very clearly that a mechanism by which we can work towards preserving this environment, as we all know that the waste that we are contributing to in terms of plastic, in terms of paper, in terms of so on and so forth, what is going into our ecosystem and allowing for the upwards of one million unique creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be on the verge of extinction is because of us. But again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He also told us, as I mentioned before, وَلَا تَمْشِي فِي الْعَرْضِ مَرَهَا Don't even walk with a sense of pride on the ground, let alone allowing and contributing to the defecation of this world that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. So step number one, to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing us by everything that is around us. Step number two, responsibility number two, to making sure that we're not contributing to waste. It's really, really important. Number three, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in another verse of the whole Qur'an, He states, وَمَا مِن دَابَّةٍ فِي الْأَرْضُ وَلَا طَائِرٍ يَتِيرُ بِجَنَاهَيْ إِلَّا أُمَمٌ أَمْثَالُكُمْ He states that there is not an animal that crawls in the earth, nor a bird that flies in the sky, except that they are not in a community just like you. Meaning that we live amongst all of these other creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And part of environmental justice is to actually care for those animals that are around us and those species that are around us. Be it the fish when we're consuming plastic, or be it the birds that fly in the sky as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where we see that God knows the statistics since the Industrial Revolution about how many species of the sky again are on the verge of extinction, extinction due to the pollution in the sky. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, know that they are a creation just like you. And that they are in communities just like you. And they are seeking survival just like you. And again, as I mentioned before, they are also the creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are in a state of glorification, in a state of praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we get this from Ahlul Bayt alayhim salatu wa salam in their practice as well. It is stated that one day, the Prophet alayhi salam, he was talking to his companions about the rights of the animals over the human being. Even animals have rights over the human being. And he goes through six or eight of them, 
One of them he says that when you're not riding the animal, we don't ride on animals these days, but in the case that we do, but just in terms of understanding the context, he states that when you are riding an animal, make sure that you're only sitting on it when you're riding on it. What does that mean? Today, for instance, when we are getting ready, for instance, to leave the program, for those of you who drive here, for instance, you'll go and you'll sit in the car, you'll get in your car, put your bag in the back, sit in the driver's seat, wear your seat belt, and someone will pull up next to you, for instance. We don't have a parking lot. This is a bad example. As I was speaking in a mosque that has a parking lot, for instance. Everyone goes, they sit in the car, and they start conversing with one another, right? With their windows down. They just don't stop talking. We love talking, right? We love socializing. I say, guys, we have to finish 10 o'clock. We have to leave the space. Okay, everyone leaves the space. They go right out there by the shoes. Guys, 10 o'clock, we need to leave. It's 10.05. Okay, no worries. Sorry, Shale. We're going to go to the elevators, right? 10.15, man. Guys, I said we have to leave the space. Okay, no worries. Outside till 11 o'clock, everyone's standing outside. No worries. It's okay. I like it. It's beautiful. It's really, really important. We like to socialize. Back, that, back in that day, they used to leave the mosque after the sermon of the Prophet, after prayers. They would go back to where their horses so they can go back. So they would sit on top of their horses, then they would see their friend, hey man, how's it going? You wanna go and hang out? What are you doing tonight? They're having conversations with another, with one another, but they're sitting on top of their horses. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, if you're not riding the horse, then don't sit on it, because you're abusing it. You wanna have a conversation with somebody, alight from the horse, have that conversation in order to give them a little bit of a break. He states that when you're riding a horse and you're going from one community to another, one city to another, and you cross by a well, you cross by an area where there's fruits, he said, alight from the horse and offer it to him or her before you take it for yourself. And then he says, furthermore, if you are not going to stop there for yourself, meaning I'm not hungry, I'm not thirsty, then you stop and you ask that horse if they want to drink or if they want to eat, even if you don't want. Think about the wisdom and the mercy of the Messenger You know when we say وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةٌ لِلْعَالَمِينَ That the Messenger was not sent except to be a mercy to the worlds means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him to be a mercy to the worlds not to the human beings. And if I want to emanate the mercy of the Prophet then I do it by taking care of the world that I'm living in. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we say every day within our prayers, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, all praises due to the Lord of the worlds, not this world. And that God is the creator and He's the Lord of all of this. So I am just a small speck in this massive universe. I have a sense of responsibility. In another occasion, it is said that the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, please recite one salawat alhamdulillah. <laughs> We're also going green in order to... And these water bottles are being sold for $15 for a live stream. <laughs> Please do purchase them. We try to limit our waste over here. And we are still not perfect and we're always looking for suggestions. So if people can help as well in terms of that, it would be wonderful. Um, so please don't also waste the cups outside. Anyhow, we come and we see on that day the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was, he was, he was, he had fallen asleep in the masjid. And he was wearing a very long garb like this garb that I'm wearing. It's very, he had a long sleeve. And when the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had woken up, he saw that there was a cat sleeping on his sleeve. And he looked at the cat and he realized that if he had moved, that cat would have woken up. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he began to remove the threads on his sleeve in order they can pull his hand out so that the cat would not move. That the sleeve would not move from beneath the cat. They said that in that course of that moment, a man entered. And he said, O oh, Messenger of God, what are you doing? Why are you ripping your shirt? He says, the cat is sleeping. He says, O oh, Rasulullah, you are the Messenger of God. Who cares about the cat? He says, I am the messenger and the mercy to all of the worlds. And it's my responsibility to care for this cat and to not wake him up when he's sleeping. So he goes and he pulls his hand out that way. On the day of Ashura, Imam al-Hussein we're not, not even there yet, but Imam al-Hussein 
when he reaches the water after every one of his family members and companions had been killed. He was the last one to go into battle. He reaches the river Euphrates. He alights from his horse. Do you know how thirsty your Imam was? He looks toward his horse and he says, Oh horse, take a sip of water. And the horse looks back at Imam al Hussein and looks at him and says, in other words, how can I drink when the son of the Messenger of God is not drunk? And as the Imam السلام, put his hand down to go and take some of that water, the army of Umar bin Sa'd, he calls out toward his army, O oh, army, look, Hussein drinks while his women and children are being looted. And he gets back on the horse and he rushes back toward his tent. That sense of care for the environment around us. We find other numerous traditions in which the Prophet وسلم, he states that if someone removes a rock on a walking path, that allows for people to walk freely, for instance. Some, a barrier is another, in other words, a barrier is sort of in place, and that individual comes and he removes that barrier so people can walk freely on a walking path, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has reserved paradise for that person. Can you think about it? Again, tradition after tradition, what can we do? It starts with us understanding that we have responsibility. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing us. That we need to make sure that we're not wasting. That we need to make sure that even in the smallest things, and if that means having a refillable bottle of water, or when we go to the coffee shop to take our own cup of coffee, and I'm talking to myself before anyone else, but we have to start with understanding that we have a sense of responsibility. We are never able to get anywhere without understanding the first phase. And that is that it's my job towards striving, toward emanating this justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the earth and placing things where they need to be and having a sense of care for the skies and having a sense of care for the waters and having a sense of care for the environment that I'm living in because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again has created that they have rights over us and that we have responsibilities to it. If you understand what I'm saying. So what are we going to do? How much are we going to strive? How much are we going to make those incremental changes toward making a difference in the world that we're living in? That's what it's all about. If we don't care, if we don't understand that all of this is supposed to be a stepping stone for our own spiritual growth, then my friends, then we're lacking in terms of understanding our purpose in this world. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. That then brings me to my conclusion. There's a sense of responsibility for caring for the environment that we're in. And also understanding that there's a sacredness to the spaces that we're in as well. In the same way that we have to care for the external environment and making sure that we're recycling, making sure that we're not over-consuming, making sure that we're not wasting, to understand that also in places of worship, for instance, that there is a sense of sanctity. In a place like this, we have to be in a state of humility when we enter into it. Understanding the etiquette of what it means to be in a place of the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's also creating and cultivating that sense of environment. As I mentioned before, there's a natural environment, there's a social environment, and then there's a spiritual environment. To keeping a place like this clean is important. To keeping a place like this quiet during the time of programming, for instance, is important to understanding that it's a place by which people connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that we're not here to pass judgments and that we're here to meet people with where they are at is all in terms of creating a positive environment. And amongst those places which have a sense of sanctity to it within Islamic tradition is the holy city of Mecca, of course. It is known as Masjid al-Haram, the sacred mosque. There's a sense of sacredness and sanctity to it. That when you're in Mecca and you're within the holy proximity, certain things they're forbidden on you. When you enter into Mecca, you have to enter into the state of Ahram every time you enter into Mecca. That when you enter into Mecca, you cannot even take one piece of grain, one rock, one piece of sand from that city and take it back home, for instance, or remove it from Mecca. You're not allowed to uproot plants in the holy city of Mecca. You're not allowed to hunt in Mecca. There's again, there's a sense of sanctity within that city. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, وَمَنْ دَخَلَهُ كَانَ آمِنًا That the one who enters into it, they should be at peace. 
and for every human being in human history that when they enter into Mecca they don't have to worry about their lives they don't have to worry about their own sanctity they don't have to worry about bloodshed they don't have to worry about their women nor about their children because you enter into the proximity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where there's a certain etiquette where there's a certain charisma to it every single individual when they enter they enter in that state of peace <coughs> except for one man and that was our master Abi Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam he leaves the holy city of Medina as I mentioned last night on the 28th of the month of Rajab because Walid ibn Utba he comes toward the Imam and he tells them that either you pledge allegiance to Yazid or we kill you. So it is said that he goes back toward his family members and he prepares them. And as I mentioned last night, he bids farewell toward his grandfather, the Messenger of God, and toward his mother, Fatima al Zahra, and toward his brother, Imam al Hassan, at the graveyard of Al Baqi. And they make their way toward Mecca because thinking that if you leave Medina, no one can shed blood, no one would dare shed blood in the holy city of Mecca. And the Imam السلام, prepared to stay there for the duration of the A'mal of Hajj. But on the 8th of the month of the Hijjah, in what is known as Yawm At-Tarwiyah, Yawm At-Tarwiyah is the day when all of the Hujjaj, they begin to prepare themselves to go toward Arafat, the city of Mecca in itself, is basically void of people. Everyone is in their hotels, everyone is in their tents, everyone is in the outskirts getting ready so they can go toward the land of Arafat, the most important day of the Hajj. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam on the day of At Tarwiyah, the eighth of the month of the Hijjah, he hears news that Yazid ibn Muawiyah has dispatched 1,000 people ready to shed the blood of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam in the proximity of the Holy Ka'bah. Imam al Hussein, he is the man who the Holy Kaaba has its reverence in due to his grandfather. A thousand people with swords ready to strike Imam al Hussein, السلام, even if it meant in the sanctity of the Grand Mosque. Imam al Hussein, السلام, he goes toward his brother Abu al Fadl al Abbas. And he says, Oh Abu al-Fadl, that we have to leave. We have to leave Mecca. To which many people, they came toward him and they said, Oh Imam al Hussein, where are you going to go? He responds, he said, Now is the time and now is the day in which I have been foreshadowed by my, mess, by my grandfather, the Messenger of God, alayhi salam. So the Imam alayhi salatu wasalam, he begins to prepare his family members and he begins to prepare his companions telling them that we have to evacuate the holy city and the holy precinct. So while everyone else within the city of Mecca was preparing and they were wearing their ahram as the poet states that everyone was getting ready, they were wearing their ahram for hajj so they can go toward Arafat there was one caravan that on that day they were preparing a different type of attire they were preparing a different type of garment while everyone was wearing their white ahram the family of the messenger of God was wearing their white shrouds of death while everyone was going toward Arafat one caravan was leaving toward going toward Karbala and Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he gathers together that family and that companion, that group of companions of his who are loyal, like loyalty would even be ashamed to say that we are loyal in the eyes of the companions of Hussein alayhi salam. They departed Mecca and they began to make their journey toward the land that was foretold by the Messenger of God. And on this day, the second of Muharram, the day that just passed us, it is the day when the caravan of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam it arrived in that great city, in that city known as Karbala. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, when he entered into that city, his horse stopped moving. And he told the horse, Resume, let's continue to move. And the horse did not move. So Imam al Hussein alayhi salam he alighted from his horse 
and he went toward those who lived in that area, the tribe known as Banu Asad. He says, O oh, people of Banu Asad, tell me, what do you call this place? And they said that, O oh, grandson of the Messenger of God, we call this place Ghadariya. He said, tell me another name. He said, we call this place Shat Farat. This is the river bank of the Euphrates. That Euphrates that the Imam السلام, could not take one sip of water from. He said, tell me another name. They said, O oh, grandson of the Messenger of God, we call this land Karbala. For those of you who understand Arabic language, the Imam السلام, he states, Innaha huna ardu karbun wabala. The word Karbala means the land of trials and tribulations. And it is said that Imam al Hussein السلام, he kneeled down to the ground and he picked up a little bit of that sand and he smelt it. And then he looks toward his caravan and he says, Oh my family members and oh my friends, that surely this is the land of trials and tribulations. Then he looks toward his sister Zainab and he says, Oh Zainab, this is the land that our grandfather foretold us about. And then he goes with Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas and they begin to sort of take a look at the land that they're in, take a look at that barren desert. And he looks toward the right and he says, Oh Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, he says, I can see my son Ali and al-Akbar being martyred in this location. And then he looks toward the left and he says, Oh Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, he says, I can see your hands being severed in these locations. And then he looks toward Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas and he says, that's where the body of Qasim would be trampled. And then he looks toward Zainab. And for those of you who have been to Karpara, you take your heart back to that location, that area, which is the most tragic of them all. A location known as Atil al Zainabi, the hill of Zainab. And it is said that Imam al Hussein, alayhi salam, he looks toward Lady Zainab, alayhi salam, and says, Oh Zainab, on this hill you will stand on the 10th of Muharram, and you will watch as Shimr bin Dil Joshan sits on my chest and begins to sever my head. One by one, he says that this is the place where our men will be killed, and this is the place where our children will be slaughtered, and this is the place where our women will become prisoners. And at that moment, he looks toward Zainab, and Zainab is overcome with emotion. And Imam al Hussein alayhi salam says, Oh Zainab, just remain patient for that day and that night that's going to transpire after my martyrdom. For here our tents will be, and here our tents will burn. And here here is where the children will run from tent to tent, O oh Zainab, be patient. But I tell you this, my dear friends, and I'll leave you with this last note. Tonight is the night in which we re recollect and we remember when the caravan of Ahlul Bayt, they arrived in Karbara. But on the 12th of Muharram, we fast forward 10 nights to when the caravan of Muhammad and Wa Ali Muhammad had to leave Karbara. It is said that one by one, the women and the children, they were being whipped by the whips of Shimr bin Dil Joshan. And they look to one another and Zainab alayhi salam along with Umm Kulthum, they pick up all of the children and they pick up all of the women and they put them on the backs of those horses and this without saddles on the back of those donkeys as they're getting ready toward leaving the city of Karbara. Zainab alayhi salam, have you ever ridden on a horse before? It's not easy to get on top. But Zainab alayhi salam picking up every single one of them. And she's doing her best toward caring for these children. She's also tired, she's also hungry, she's also thirsty, she's also so exhausted and at the end there was only Zainab and Umm Kulthum, these two sisters with their courage and with their bravery they were able to allow for everyone to get on top of the horses and they looked at one another and Umm Kulthum looks toward Zainab, Zainab looks toward Umm Kulthum, Zainab says oh my sister let me help you get on top and then Umm Kulthum says but oh Zainab who is going to help you get on? She says don't worry I have an idea at this moment she helps Umm Kulthum get on top of the animal and then she looks toward the river Euphrates and she says, oh my brother Abel Fadl al-Abbas, when we left Medina, you were there, and when you left Mecca, we were there for me, who is going to help me? But oh, Zainab, your brother Abel Fadl al-Abbas. <laughs> we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by our love for Hussein, wa jaddihi wa abi. وأمه وأخي وتسعة المعصومين من ذريته سلواتك عليهم أجمعين We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow for our lives to resemble the lives of Muhammad and Wa'ali Muhammad. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow for our death to remember the death of Muhammad and Wa'ali Muhammad. 
And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us in paradise with Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with these tears and with this grief to forgive our sins. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow for us to illuminate the justice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks for. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are amongst those who are able to be mechanisms for change in this life so that we're able to create a system of equity for all of those around us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the success of these programs and these majalis moving forward. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the ziyara of Imam al-Hussein in this life and his shafa'a in the next life. Allahumma rizqna ziyara al-Hussein fi dunya wa shafa'at al-Hussein fi al-akhara. Walhamdulillah rabbil alameen wa sallallahumma ala sayyidina wa nabiyina Muhammad wa ala ahl baytih al-tayyibin al-tahirin. If I can ask you all to recite one surah al-Fatiha, but before that one salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.